In this video I'll be going through the 2021 May-June IGCSE Physics Theory Extended paper. A skydiver of mass 76 kilograms is falling vertically in still air. At time t equals zero, the skydiver opens his parachute. Figure 1.1 is the speed time graph for the skydiver from t equals zero. Using figure 1.1, determine the deceleration of the skydiver immediately after the parachute opens. Looking at the first section of our graph, we can see we more or less have a linear gradient. The slope of this line is going to give us the acceleration, specifically our change in velocity, which from 60 to 40 is 20, divided by the duration over which it occurred, which is half a second, giving me 40 meters per second per second. Determine the force due to air resistance acting on the skydiver immediately after the parachute opens. If we picture our skydiver with a parachute, we have a force due to gravity pointing downwards, and we have our resulting deceleration upwards. Our air resistance must not only be providing this deceleration upwards, it must also be opposing our gravitational force. Our acceleration is our 40, and our gravitational acceleration is our 10, meaning that our force is going to be our mass times our acceleration, where our mass is our 76, and our acceleration is our 40 plus 10, which gives me 3,800 newtons. Explain in terms of the forces acting on the skydiver, the motion between t equals 0 and t equals 6 seconds. From 0 to 3 seconds, we see that we have a slope on our speed time graph, and therefore an acceleration. What this means is that we have a net force. This net force is due to the fact that our gravity force is less than our force from drag of our parachute. Because our force of drag is proportional to the speed, as our speed decreases, our drag force does too. To the point where between 3 and 6 seconds, we see that we have no slope and therefore no acceleration, which means that our gravity force and our friction force must be balanced. So let's write that down. During the first 3 seconds, the drag force is greater than the gravitational force, causing a net force and acceleration upward, reducing the speed. As the speed reduces, so does the drag, until the force is balanced and a constant velocity is reached. Explain why opening the parachute cannot reduce the speed of the skydiver to zero. This is because at terminal velocity the forces are balanced and the acceleration is zero, therefore the speed remains constant. Figure 2.1 shows a wooden trolley of mass 1.2 kilograms at rest on the rough surface of a bench. A ball of mass 0.52 grams travels horizontally towards the trolley. The ball embeds itself in the wood of the trolley. The trolley moves with an initial speed of 0.065 meters per second. Calculate the impulse exerted on the trolley. The impulse exerted on the trolley is going to be equal to the final momentum of the trolley ball system, where momentum is mass times velocity, where our mass is the combination of the ball and the trolley, 0.52 grams or 0.00052 kilograms, plus the mass of our trolley, which is 1.2 kilograms, multiplied by our speed, which is 0.065, which gives me 0.078 kilogram meters per second. Calculate the speed of the ball as it hits the trolley. We know that the momentum of the ball must be equal to the final momentum of the trolley ball system, which is our momentum we found here. We also know that it must be equal to the mass of the ball multiplied by its velocity that we're trying to find. Solve for velocity by dividing both sides by mass. With our momentum of 0.078 and our mass of 0.00052 kilograms, gives me 150 meters per second. As the trolley moves across the rough surface, it slows and stops. Explain in terms of the work done, the energy change that takes place as the trolley slows down. The trolley's initial kinetic energy is converted to thermal and sound energy due to the work done by friction. Explain in terms of molecules why liquids are very difficult to compress. In liquids, the molecules are already very close together and will exert large repulsive forces upon each other. Figure 3.1 shows a device that uses liquid pressure to lift heavy boxes. 
The boxes are lifted by pumping oil into the cylinder. The force upwards on the piston due to the oil, and the force downwards on the piston due to the air above the piston, combine to produce a constant force of 8,800 newtons. The pressure of the air is 1 times 10 to the 5 pascals, and the cross-sectional area of the bottom surface of the piston is 0.016 meters square. Calculate the pressure of the oil at the bottom surface of the piston. So we are looking for the pressure upon this surface here, and we know that the force of our oil and our force of our air combine to produce our force of 8800. Because we know that the boxes are being lifted, we know that this constant force must be upwards, meaning that the force from our oil must be the greater. So we know that our 8800 newtons is equal to the force of our oil minus the force of our air. Recall that pressure is equal to force divided by area. Rearranged for force, our force is equal to our pressure multiplied by our area. Meaning that we can rewrite this as our pressure of our oil multiplied by our area minus our pressure of our air multiplied by the same area. Where we know the pressure of our air, we know our area. And so we just need to solve for PO. We can do this by dividing both sides by the area and then adding PA to both sides and swapping them around. Putting our numbers in, which gives me 6.5 times 10 to the 5 pascals. As the boxes are lifted, the depth of the oil increases. Explain why the pump must exert an increasing pressure on the oil as the depth of the oil increases. An increased height of oil means an increased amount of oil, exerting an increased downwards weight needing to be counteracted. Suggest one reason why the force of 8,800 newtons in B cannot lift boxes of weight 8,800 newtons. If our resultant upwards force is equal to our weight force, then the forces would be balanced and we wouldn't have any acceleration. The forces would be balanced so no movement would occur. An aluminium saucepan with a plastic handle contains cold water. Figure 4.1 shows the saucepan on a hot plate. State why the plan is made from aluminium, but the handle is made from plastic. Aluminium is a good heat conductor, plastic is a poor heat conductor. And we of course want our saucepan to be a good conductor of heat to transfer the energy from the hot plate to the water. We don't want the same for our handle in order to protect our hands. The hot plate is switched on, and as the temperature of the water increases, the internal energy of the water increases. State in terms of molecules what is meant by an increase in internal energy. This means that the molecules have a greater kinetic energy. Explain in terms of the atomic lattice and electrons how thermal energy is transferred through the aluminium. The atomic lattice and electrons vibrate, passing this vibration via collisions to neighbouring atoms, sharing their thermal energy. Eventually, the water reaches boiling point. Thermal energy from the hot plate is still being transferred to the water. Explain in terms of molecules the effect of this thermal energy on the water. The water molecules gain enough thermal energy to overcome the attractive forces between them, causing them to escape the liquid as vapour. The mass of the water decreases by 0.11 kilograms in 300 seconds. The specific latent heat of vaporization of water is 2.3 times 10 to the 6 joules per kilogram. Calculate the rate at which the water gains thermal energy. And so the energy difference in our 300 seconds is our reduction in mass 0.11 kilograms multiplied by the energy per kilogram, which gives me 2.53 times 10 to the 5 joules. Power is just energy over time, where our energy is our 2.53 times 10 to the 5, and our time is our 300 seconds, which gives me 840 watts to two significant figures. Figure 5.1 shows the structure of a liquid in glass thermometer. The bulb of the thermometer is placed into a beaker of warm water. As the liquid expands, it moves along the tube. Explain in terms of molecules why a liquid expands when heated. As the molecules heat up, they gain an increased kinetic energy, causing them to collide with each other more often and more energetically. Explain in terms of molecules why a liquid expands more than a solid when heated. Liquid molecules are less bound, so require less work to separate them. 
A second thermometer has a larger bulb that contains more of the same liquid than the thermometer shown in figure 5.1. It has a different scale, in every other way it is identical. Explain how the sensitivity of the second thermometer compares with the sensitivity of the thermometer in figure 5.1. If our thermometer had a larger bulb with more liquid, then at the same temperature we're going to have more liquid expanding, and therefore register a larger value on our scale, meaning that we're going to have a greater sensitivity. A greater amount of liquid will cause a greater reading on the scale at the same temperature. This results in a more sensitive thermometer. Explain how the range of the second thermometer compares with the range of the thermometer in figure 5.1. The second thermometer will have less range because it will max out at a lower temperature, meaning that at, for example, 20 degrees, our original thermometer might give us a reading of a particular value, but because we have more expansion in our second thermometer with our more liquid, at that same 20 degrees we could have maxed out our thermometer. State one everyday problem that is a result of thermal expansion. This is a very open-ended question with a large range of possible responses. One that comes to mind is the expansion of railway tracks. We could imagine our railway tracks, and if they were just one solid piece, as they heat they would expand, because this increased length has to go somewhere, we would no longer end up with straight tracks. Suggest and explain one way of solving this problem. The solution here is to leave gaps between your tracks to allow the metal to expand into. Figure 6.1 is a full-scale diagram that represents a sound wave travelling in air. On figure 6.1, mark two points each at the centre of a different compression, label both of the points C. We have four compressions here, and as per the question, we'll label two of them C. The speed of sound in air is 330 meters per second. Measure the diagram and determine the frequency of the sound. To determine the frequency, we can use the fact that our wave velocity is equal to our wavelength multiplied by the frequency, where we know the speed of sound, we're trying to find our frequency, but we don't know our wavelength. What we can do, however, is measure it here. If I had this printed on a piece of A4 paper, the mark sheet says this should be about 0.052 meters. Rearranging this equation for our frequency by dividing both sides by lambda, putting our numbers in, giving me 6300 Hz. The wave reaches a barrier, figure 6.2 shows the wave passing through a gap in the barrier. The frequency of the wave is increased to a value many times greater than the value obtained in B. Describe and explain two ways in which a diagram representing the wave with a greater frequency differs from figure 6.2. If we have a greater frequency then our compressions are going to be closer together and we're also going to see less bending around because shorter wavelengths diffract less. Figure 7.1 represents an alternating current AC generator. A student rotates the handle H, as shown in figure 7.1. On figure 7.2, sketch a graph to show how the electromotive force EMF between terminals X and Y varies with time during two complete revolutions of the coil. Because this is an alternating current, we're going to have a sinusoidal relationship, and we're also going to see two full wave cycles. One and two. Where along this axis we have our EMF, and along this axis we have our time. On figure 7.2, mark and label a point P for the EMF when the coil is horizontal as shown in figure 7.1. When our coil is horizontal, it is cutting across the maximum amount of field, and therefore we're going to get the maximum EMF. So our point P could be at any peak or any trough. The student turns the handle more quickly. State two ways in which the EMF between terminals X and Y changes. A greater coil velocity means a greater maximum EMF, and because the handle is moving more quickly, we're going to see a greater frequency. Terminals X and Y are connected to the primary coil of a transformer. State and explain what happens in the transformer as the student turns the handle of the AC generator. Firstly we have an alternating current in the primary coil, causing a changing magnetic field in the secondary, inducing an alternating current in the secondary. 
explain why the power losses in transmission cables are lower when the electrical energy is transmitted at higher voltages. Recalling that V equals IR and recalling that P equals IV, we can replace our V with our IR, giving us I squared R. And we can see if we have the same resistance and if we have a higher voltage we'll have a lower current then we're going to see less power lost to our resistance and so for the same amount of power a higher voltage requires less current if resistance is constant then less current means less energy lost as heat a student sets up a circuit that includes a 12 volt battery, an 800 ohm resistor, a voltmeter, and a thermistor. Figure 8.1 is an incomplete circuit diagram because the symbol for the thermistor is missing. The thermistor is connected between terminals P and Q. Complete figure 8.1 by drawing the symbol for a thermistor between terminals P and Q. The symbol for a thermistor is a resistor with a hockey stick going through it. The 12 volt battery consists of 8 identical cells connected in series. Calculate the electromotive force of each cell. That is quite simply our 12 volts divided by 8 cells, which gives me 1.5 volts. The reading on the voltmeter is 8 volts. Determine the resistance of the thermistor. If we have 8 volts across here, then we must have 4 volts across here, because these two voltages must add to our 12. Because this is a series circuit, the current through every component is the same. To determine the resistance of the thermistor, we can use Ohm's law, V equals IR, which we can rearrange for resistance by dividing both sides by I. Where we know our voltage, but we don't know the current. Because this is a series circuit, the current through every component is the same. So if we find the current through this component here, we now have the current through our thermistor here. We can once again use our Ohm's law of V equals IR, this time solving for current by dividing both sides by R, knowing that our voltage is at 4 volts and our resistance is 800 ohms, giving me 0.005 amps. Putting our numbers in for our thermistor, gives me 1,600 ohms. A few hours later, the student notices that the reading on the voltmeter is greater. Explain what can be deduced from this observation. A greater reading on this voltmeter must mean that we have a greater loss of energy and therefore a greater resistance across our thermistor. Assuming this is an NTC, negative temperature coefficient, then a greater resistance must mean a decreased temperature. An increased voltage must be caused by an increased resistance. For an NTC thermistor, this means the temperature must have decreased. There are three naturally occurring isotopes of hydrogen. Hydrogen 1, Hydrogen 2 and Hydrogen 3. The nuclide notation for Hydrogen 1 is this here. Write down the symbol using nuclide notation for Hydrogen 2 and Hydrogen 3. Both are hydrogen, so we have the symbol H. The amount of protons is still 1, so our atomic number is still 1. However, hydrogen 2 has an extra neutron, so an atomic mass of 2. And hydrogen 3 has 2 neutrons, giving us an atomic mass of 3. In a fusion reactor, a nucleus of hydrogen 2 and a nucleus of hydrogen 3 undergo fusion. State what is meant by nuclear fusion. Nuclear fusion is when two nuclei join together to form a larger nucleus. The fusion reaction produces a free neutron and one other particle. Write down using nuclide notation the equation that represents this reaction. And so we have a hydrogen 2 and a hydrogen 3 fusing together, producing a neutron which has an atomic number of 0 and an atomic mass of 1 plus one other particle. Now because the atomic mass and the atomic number must add to the same on both sides, we have one plus one equals two on this side, so we have an atomic number of two. For our atomic mass, we have two plus three, which gives us five. We already have one on this side, which gives us a remainder of four. A particle with an atomic mass of four and an atomic number of two must be an alpha particle. Nuclear fusion in the sun is the source of most but not all of the resources that are used to generate electrical energy on Earth. State two resources for which nuclear fusion in the sun is not the source. 
The two that come to mind are geothermal, which uses the residual heat from our Earth, and also nuclear energy, which utilizes the radioactive decay of radioactive elements. And we're done.